Now, a few months back, we redrafted the most recent draft, but now with us getting closer to the end of the season and quite a mix up in the order, today I want to redraft the 2021 NBA draft once again. If you guys like the content, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button. Let's go for 42 likes on today's video and let's get into this. Today's video is sponsored by Prize Picks, the super simple to use player prop site, legal in most US states. They just give you lines of certain players you pick over or under for up to 10 times your entry. And today, boys, we got surgical. I don't think I've ever been this confident in an entry. The first thing I saw when scrolling was RJ Barrett's points were at 23 and a half. He's been on fire. He's at the over on that in five of his last six games, easy. Then I saw Marcus Smart assists were at six, something he's also hit in five of his last six games, put it in there. And then I put in Cade Cunningham's points, rebounds, and assists over, which was at 31 and a half. And surprise, surprise, he's hit the over on that in five of his last six games. And then lastly, I added an under, not very like me, but I took Jason Tatum's under on threes, which was at three and a half. Something that was tough to do after he just hit eight in his last performance, but three and a half is just such a big line that I think it's great value. If this hits, my $20 entry is gonna become $200. And if you wanna play along, Go to the link in the description, use code Jimmer, and they're actually going to give you a deposit match up to 100 bucks, which is crazy. Thank you, PrizePix, for sponsoring today's video. This specific draft is really fun to redo, as unlike most years, there's a real debate for every single selection. The debates start with the number one pick in the hands of the Detroit Pistons. Leading up to the draft, there was no question who was going to be the number one selection, regardless of who even held it. It was going to be Kate Cunningham the six foot eight point guard out of Oklahoma State that had just averaged 20 points, six rebounds and four assists, shooting 40% from three as a freshman. The risk just didn't seem to be there and the upside seemed limitless. Now, since the draft, the gap has tightened, leading to some really heated debates about who is the top rookie in the league right now. There's a lot of people that have some super strong conviction about this topic, but odds are you put two NBA fans in a room, they probably have a different guy at the top of their board. I would say there's about four guys you're allowed to bring up, but really only two you can seriously consider. That's Kate Cunningham, the original number one pick as we just mentioned, and Evan Mobley, the original third overall pick and the current odds on favorite to win rookie of the year. While I truly believe Kate's ceiling is out of this world, the ability that Mobley's shown right now combined with having a pretty solid ceiling himself makes me lean towards him. Coming into the draft, I was pretty negative about Evan Mobley. Not that I didn't think he was gonna be a good prospect or wasn't gonna be a good player. I've just kind of gotten off getting behind seven footers as top picks anymore. Obviously, that's a blanket statement that changes on a case-by-case -case basis. In general, I've been under the belief that it's much harder to predict a big success before the draft. It's much harder to construct a championship roster with one as your foundation. And a lot of times, they turn into unfavorable contracts outside of their rookie deal. Now, this seems odd to say when the MVP race is currently between two centers, which is a factor in my changing mindset. Mobley's proved me wrong to the point where I obviously now have him as the number one pick. What really jumps out is his defense. As just a rookie, he's already considered one of the elite defenders of the league. He looks like a young Anthony Davis or Kevin Garnett on that end. His versatility is what really makes him scary. He holds his opponents to the second lowest field goal percentage at the basket. The only guy ahead of him is his teammate, Jared Allen. Away from the basket, his coordination and long strides allow him to disrupt the whole offense, possession after possession. He will have a defensive player of the year when it's all said and done, maybe a couple. So there's no question the defense is there, but you're gonna have to have more than that to justify him being selected over the upside that comes with a guy like Kate Cunningham. This year, Mobley's averaging 15 points, shooting 50% from the field. Nothing insane, but on a competitive roster like Cleveland with a lot of mouse to feed, that's pretty impressive. And man, does he pass the eye test with flying colors. His size and athleticism makes the easy stuff effortless, but it's the times when he has the ball in his hands for an extended period that really get you thinking about what he could be. While he hasn't been the most efficient three-point threat, the shooting stroke is there. He has proven that ability through multiple stages of his career. It's going to come. It's not often you have a seven-footer this coordinated. Both his face-up game and skill as a ball handler make it a realistic possibility he's really gonna be able to ramp up his volume as an efficient creator which considering his defense makes me confident with him going here based on everything we know right now. So after that, you've got the Rockets at two. They originally went with Jalen Green. Jalen Green had crazy expectations coming out of the G League where he absolutely dominated. By the start of the season, he was practically tied for the top rookie of the year odds. Early success felt like a given, but that hasn't necessarily been the case. His season has been filled with ups and downs. And while he's still gonna be going pretty early, the Rockets now have the chance to get Cade Cunningham, an opportunity they didn't have before, and they jump on it. This year, Kate is averaging 17 points, 
six rebounds and five assists. Super impressive box score numbers, but his efficiency of 40% from the field and 32% from three isn't quite what you expect from someone that was deemed the consensus number one selection. Now he is just a rookie, something people say way too often, but for the most part, Cade has been legitimately impressive and I'm excited about his future. The start of the season was rough, no question, but then we saw him go through a lengthy 20 game stretch in the middle of the season where he was shooting 46% from the field in 41% from three. All the potential that had us excited before the draft, his frame at the point guard position and his ability to use it to his advantage, his playmaking, his shooting beyond the perimeter, they've all been on display, maybe just not at one time. What really gets me excited is his consistent ramp up in volume throughout the course of a game. He truly really wants to be that guy for this roster. I think once he gets more and more comfortable, we're going to see him put everything together, hopefully get to the free throw line a little bit more and be that player the Pistons wanted when they took him number one overall. For the Rockets, I think they're more than excited about how this redraft worked out. At three, you've got the Cavaliers, who you'd have to assume aren't too thrilled with the event of a redraft, missing out on Evan Mobley. But with that said, there's still some super solid options here. I really think it comes down to two guys just based on the position that they're in, the original 7th overall pick Jonathan Kaminga, or the 4th overall pick Scotty Barnes, who I ultimately think they go with. It seems like a pretty simple decision, given just how impressive he's been and the fact that he plays the same position as Mobley, so it won't affect the other parts of this roster. I really think Scotty still isn't getting the attention that he really deserves. While I couldn't justify it right now, it's not out of the question that we're redrafting him as the number one pick in a few years. Let's just remember how Scotty was viewed as a prospect before the draft. This was a guy that came off the bench as a freshman at Florida State, finished the year averaging 10 points on not so impressive efficiency. The exciting parts of his game were his frame, defense, and playmaking for the position. It was very, very clear that the expectations for him as a rookie, especially scoring the ball, were some of the lowest in the entire lottery. Then he comes out and he shows us those sides of his game we were all excited about, but he's also averaging 15 points shooting 49% from the field. Impressive, but it's really what he showed us in individual performances that's so crazy considering the preseason expectations. Just in the past couple weeks, he scored 28 points on two separate occasions. He's already had three games, finishing with three or more threes and 20 plus point performances. This is a guy that's six foot nine with a seven foot three wingspan. The defense is there, the playmaking is there. There's a lot of mouths to feed in Toronto, but as the 20 plus point performances become more and more of a regularity, he's gonna be a scary sight to see. With the physical tools he possesses, we are gonna see a completely different player five years from now than what we see today. Similar to what we've seen with guys like Kawhi Leonard or Giannis Antetokounmpo, not comparing them directly, I just think we're gonna see a pretty similar career arc, as crazy as that sounds. The fourth overall pick is in the hands of the Raptors, who no longer have the chance to grab Scotty Barnes, but there's still some really solid options here, most of which I don't hate, but I think they go with Franz Wagner here, who was originally selected with the eighth overall pick. Coming into the draft, scouts loved his size, length, athleticism, and fluidity, but he was looked at as extremely raw. No one thought he'd be putting up some of the best numbers in the whole entire class. This year, he's averaging 16, five and three, shooting 47% from the field in 37% from three. With him just scratching the surface of his potential, while the Raptors would love to hold on to Scotty, I don't think they're too mad about this result. This draft class has really got me excited. When you just look at the long-term outlook, player by player, it's hard not to be extremely excited. The fifth overall pick belongs to the Magic. They originally went with Jalen Suggs, who has easily been the most disappointing top pick so far. I think it's pretty clear that there's three options. Jonathan Kaminga, Josh Giddy, and Jalen Green. The backcourt was already crowded when they selected Suggs. I think they keep it simple and they go with Kaminga. Earlier in the year, this really wouldn't have been an option for me, but since the injury to Draymond Green, we've gotten the chance to see Jonathan Kaminga is the real deal. In the last 25 games, he's averaging 13 points and 4 rebounds, shooting 54% from the field and 37% from 3. It wasn't pretty offensively for him in the G League a season ago. It was his physical tools that carried him to being the 7th overall pick to the Warriors. Those tools have been extremely evident. Any moment he's on the court, he is one if not the most physically imposing players out there. The versatility is no question. The offense sure isn't refined, but considering where it was a year ago, compared to today where he's shooting league average from three on pretty decent volume, it's hard not to get excited about what's to come. Kaminga's in a really interesting spot with this Warriors team from here on out this year. While he's exciting with highlight moment after highlight moment, he is young and can look lost on defense. I'm curious to see where he is on the rotation once they have both Draymond and Andre Iguodala fully healthy, if that ever happens. The sixth overall pick is in the hands of the Thunder, who've got a big decision to make. Do they stick with their original selection of Josh Giddy, or do they take advantage of the new opportunity to get the original second overall pick, Jalen Green? 
I already know, half of you guys are thinking, there's no way they take green over Giddy, while the other half think green should have been gone like five picks ago. I think it's close, but they stick with Giddy. Man, has it been fun to watch him play this season. In 10 years from now, we're going to be looking back at him as a prospect and wonder why we weren't more excited about a 6'8 point guard with elite court vision that was putting up better numbers at the same age in the same league that LaMelo Ball, the reigning rookie of the year, was in the season prior. In the last 15 games, Giddy has averaged 15 points, 9 rebounds, and 7 assists, shooting 46% from the field. The first thing that blows you away is this kid's passing ability consistently making cross-court passes when it didn't even seem like a possibility. I think it's safe to say right now, he's already the best inbounds passer in the whole league. At 6'8", he's going to be a triple-double machine. A lot of his moves are funky but effective. He has no problem getting to where he wants on the court. As the season has gone on, he's just gotten better and better at the basket, taking advantage of his size and using the pass-out threat masterfully. I really don't ever see him being some crazy outside threat, but if he can just become a more consistent spot-up shooter, especially with a backcourt mate like SGA, we need to watch out. Next up is the 7th overall pick in the hands of the Warriors. A few months ago, I didn't think this was possible, but somehow, some way, Jalen Green, who was looked at as the clear number 2 prospect in this class, a can't-miss prospect when he was taken 2nd overall by the Rockets, is available here at 7, and the Warriors are going to take advantage. There's some other options here that might help them a little bit more right now given their situation to legitimately compete for the title, but I just don't think they can pass up the value that comes with Green. There's a lot to get excited about with him. It's just tough to have him go much higher considering just how impressive the players ahead of him have been while also having extremely bright future outlooks as well. Going into the year, there were definitely some concerns I had, but scoring just wasn't one of them. On the year, he's averaging 15 points, shooting 40% from the field and 32% from three. Now we need to give him his respect, in his most recent stretch of games, he's been playing really well, averaging 19 on super good efficiency. But the concern with Green is, that if the efficiency struggles continue, or even just inconsistency as a scorer continues, what is he giving you outside of that? I'll tell you, not much. Now yes, that's a pretty general statement, as it's not considering the fact that his potential as a scorer is easily the highest in this whole class. But having those concerns, while a lot of other mid-lottery picks are really impressing, makes it inevitable that he's gonna slide. It definitely isn't a seamless fit with the Warriors whatsoever, but again, looking at the Warriors situation where no player here drastically affects the outlook of their season, they get the best value and maintain that elite mixture of current success as well as future assets. So that was the first half of the lottery. We're gonna speed things up a lot for the next seven selections. The first seven were pretty tough to decide pick by pick, but it was clear what guys went in what area. For the next seven, that's not the case, and everyone is probably going to have a different order, probably a whole different set of players. But starting things off here at eight, we've got the Orlando Magic, second pick of the lottery, and after grabbing Kaminga earlier, go with Chris Duarte. It stinks having him go here, when he could help so many of these other teams ready to compete right now, but the Magic just go best value available. The Kings are at nine, and stick with their original selection of Davion Mitchell. There's no option that makes a ton of sense here, so while Mitchell's numbers and overall offensive game haven't been super impressive, defensively, he really has, and the Kings clearly seem to be behind him with their willingness to let go of Tyrese Halliburton. The Grizzlies are at 10 and grab one of the biggest flyers in this draft, former second round selection to the Pelicans, Herbert Jones. This is one of the more interesting situations in this whole redraft, as the Grizzlies are actually one of the better teams in the league and are able to grab a defensive beast in Jones that since getting a big role has averaged 11 points over a steal and a block, shooting 49% from the field and 35% from three. The Hornets are at 11. They originally got James Booknight, which is only still an option, but I have them grabbing another former second round pick, Ayo Dasunmu. Dasunmu took advantage of freed up minutes in Chicago and it looks like the real deal. He's super solid on both ends and has averaged 12 points, 6 assists, and 4 rebounds, shooting 53% from the field and 39% from 3. With the departure of Ish Smith, the Hornets strengthen their backcourt depth. The Spurs are at 12, and we finally see Jalen Suggs come off the board. It's been a struggle for him, no doubt. He's shooting 37% from the field and 23% from 3, but the Spurs take the chance that he can get back to that player we thought he would be before the draft. The Pacers are at 13, and they're going with Zaire Williams. There was a lot of confusion when he went 10th overall to the Grizzlies, but for the most part, he's been really solid. The efficiency hasn't been super crazy, but his defense has kept him on the court. His mechanics look strong, the frame is there, it's a risky selection, but seeing what's on the board, the Pacers take the risk. For the last pick of the lottery, we've got the Golden State Warriors once again, and this one's tough, but I really think they go with Alperin Sagun. He's easily the top pick on the board, allowing them to ease of mind that they just need one of Sagun or Wiseman to work out. But that's the end for you guys. 
You guys tell me your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, and I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.